Me doing this with my wrists doesn't explain anything to people that haven't played Beat Saber. Humans love patterns. We love sorting things into categories and organizing them by quantifiable values and then storing all this information so we can refer back to it when we need to. Recognizing patterns is also a fundamental prerequisite for developing your critical thinking skills. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about pattern recognition because I watched my parents play Beat Saber for the first time. For those of you that don't know, Beat Saber. <laughs> Hello, sweaty Beat Saber Josh here. Just wanted to let you know that Beat Saber has a lot of flashing lights and fast moving imagery. So if you are epileptic or have sensitivity to that sort of thing, just be careful watching this video. You might want to listen to it. And then when I start talking about Dark Souls or this time code here, then it's safe to watch again. Beat Saber is a virtual reality rhythm game where you have a red saber and a blue saber and you have blocks coming at you rather quickly with arrows that tell you which way to cut them and the color tells you which saber to cut it with. Great game, love it. Highly recommend if you've never tried it. I think a good way to describe it, it's like a mix of Fruit Ninja and Guitar Hero, but so much more than both. There is Fruit Ninja in VR, isn't there? It's a pretty unique experience and watching my parents play for the first time reminded me that there were a lot of things when I first started playing that didn't come naturally. <laughs> As a beginner, there's a ton of things going on in Beat Saber that can be pretty overwhelming. You've got blocks moving towards you, sometimes pretty quickly. There are multiple colors, you've got to hit them in the right direction, and walls and bombs really seem to scare newcomers. It's a lot to process at once if you're new to virtual reality, even more if you're just new to video games in general, like my parents are. All that said, after a few hours, things start to click. There are some small patterns that like, an upstroke is generally followed by a downstroke and vice versa. And suddenly songs just flow that, that tiny bit better that makes it easier to play. After that, you start picking up on other things that are a little more complex, like specific patterns of notes that you'll notice in one song and then you'll notice it in another song and another song. And eventually it becomes part of your Beat Saber vocabulary. And this is, this is where it gets to pattern recognition, okay? I promise. <laughs> the first theory of pattern recognition that we're gonna talk about is... Hey, Future Josh here. We didn't do a great explanation of the different matching theories when we originally recorded the video. So I just wanted to go through and explain it again with some diagrams to make it a bit easier. So the first form of matching that we're gonna talk about is called prototype matching. And this is where a prototype or template or collection of attributes is stored in your memory and used to cross-reference new stimulus against the older templates that you've stored in your memory. So in this example here, we've got a chair and we can recognize, okay, chairs have legs, a horizontal surface that you can sit on and a vertical surface that supports your back. All of these attributes are stored together in like chair, chair template dot doc or dot txt, whatever. When you observe something new, you compare these templates against the new thing that you're observing. So like this bar stool, based on the information that you have, you're like, okay, it has four legs, like a chair. Uh, and it has a horizontal surface supported by those four legs and a vertical surface, even though it's, it's a bit smaller. Okay, I, I can assume this is a chair. This sort of pattern recognition is reasonably flexible and lets you take your experience of, say, hitting a complex sequence of notes in a rhythm game and use that information to apply it to other songs, even if you've never played them before. This is what I'm talking about when I say that you start building your Beat Saber vocabulary. The first example of this I remember running into personally was this circle pattern, which me doing this with my wrists doesn't explain anything to people that haven't played Beat Saber, but if you've, if you've played Beat Saber, you know. And the first time I encountered it, I really struggled with it. And then after getting it right in that one song, don't ask me what song it was, this is like six years ago now, I'd still mess it up in other songs, even though I would recognize the pattern because the context was different, the, the speed was a little bit faster, a little bit slower. It was frustrating, but eventually, after seeing it in enough different songs and getting it right in enough different songs, your brain is like, okay, I know how to do this. And there's tons of different patterns that you'll start to recognize across your entire Beat Saber collection of songs. And it's crazy 
easy that there's no official guide. So the community's just played a bunch of each other's songs and picked up on patterns that work well, that flow nicely, then have used them in their own maps, basically created a communal language that we're all familiar with. Once you start playing enough, you start developing that language without even really realizing. And then after a while, it's not even conscious. There is a point where it goes from pattern recognition into muscle memory. Muscle memory is a whole other topic, we're not getting into that. It's kind of like driving down the street and you're reading all the signs around you, but you're not really looking at them because you're familiar enough with all the different colors and shapes that you can be like, oh yeah, that's, that's a stop sign. Thinking about this sort of pattern recognition also got me thinking about patterns in other games. I think Dark Souls is kind of pattern recognition the game, but in a much less obvious way than Beat Saber. Rhythm games are literally just throwing patterns at you. It's really not difficult to be less obvious than Beat Saber. <laughs> this is where we get to our second theory of pattern recognition called feature analysis theory. In feature analysis theory, it's proposed your nervous system has some filters that breaks down the stimulus that your body is taking in before it gets sent to the brain for processing. Instead of comparing the new stimulus to the entire template that we talked about in prototype matching theory, it is proposed that each individual feature of stimulus is processed separately. The fact that a chair has four legs. You look at something with four legs, and you compare it to everything that you know has four legs. So that would be a table, a desk, a dog, I guess, a dog has four legs, but in a different way. A cat has four legs. Tapioca, do you have anything to add to this video? Anything at all? <laughs> I'm gonna take that as a no. And then after you've sorted through all the different stimulus that has come in, it tries to find the best match based on what matches the most attributes that you're observing. But okay, enough nerd shit. Back to video games, the other nerd shit. <laughs> As you play through Dark Souls for the first time, you'll learn that everything is very deliberately animated. Every step of an animation has a very specific purpose. The most common feature and the one that you'll start to recognize first is the wind up for an attack. When you first start playing, you're given enemies that it's very easy to see are coming. The decaying prisoners in the Undead Asylum are really slow and their attacks are very clearly choreographed as they raise their arm for quite a while so you can register, hey, I should maybe get out of the way, and then they blah. Eventually, as you dive deeper into the expansive monster compendium that is Dark Souls, you'll encounter creatures that are much less human and a little more difficult to read. But you'll still see that choreographing and react appropriately because you've seen it in so many different contexts that you get better and better at recognizing it. Much like the Beat Saber example, once you've seen it in enough different contexts, your brain is really good at just recognizing it like that and even in new situations, connecting the dots faster than you would otherwise. Video games are inherently built on the repetition of patterns. Familiarity with the game's mechanics and level design is the core of player progression. Games that don't provide you with enough time to learn the basics and get familiar with what's going on in the game feel like they have a really steep difficulty curve. And Dark Souls is kind of known for that, which I don't think is fair. Despite Dark Souls not really holding your hand in the tutorial, it does give you plenty of time, if you're observant, to see how the game teaches you. It is a lot more intentional than most games, and I think that's why people find it a lot more difficult, but it is still teaching you, just more subtly than you might be used to. On the flip side, games that don't advance the mechanical complexity of its levels end up feeling too easy as the player gets too familiar with what's going on in the game and the challenges that are being thrown at them. Portal is a great example of a game that feeds you the mechanics at a confident but very measured pace. It starts off pretty simple, Here's a portal, here's a button, here's a cube. You should probably put the cube on the button. I think you can you can do that, that's basic math. Then the next chamber introduces the idea of carrying items through portals. Then they give you the first half of the portal gun. And I think that's really a great design choice that makes portals so accessible that it doesn't give you access to both portals as soon as they give you the portal gun. You get through quite a few chambers with just access to the blue portal before they're like, okay, you can have, you can have the full portal gun now. 
on paper that might sound kind of slow if you haven't played Portal, but the first few chambers are only a short couple of minutes and it takes the player from use WASD to move and button open door to here, have a portable quantum tunneling device and then about maybe two thirds of the way through the game, they stop introducing new mechanics and move you from the test chambers of Aperture Science to the back rooms. It's a great visual indicator to tell the player, hey, the training wheels are being taken off now, let's see if you're paying attention, as it takes you from the very literally black and white Aperture Science chambers to the more ambiguous rust and dust of everything behind the scenes. The patterns that you learn through the test chambers, like an angled portal surface, usually means that if you look around a little bit, there's something that you can land on after you yeet yourself, are now tested in an unfamiliar context that don't follow the same rules that were established in the original testing environments. Now, as much as I am praising portals progression and the way that it teaches the player, I do feel like both Portal 1 and 2 fall short with their final boss fight because of the very limited selection of mechanics that they use in the boss fight to test the player. In Portal 1's fight against GLaDOS, only two mechanics are really tested. Your familiarity with the rocket turret, which you only encounter once beforehand. I'm going to kill you. And your ability to press a button to open the incinerator. The only real pressure in that boss fight is the time limit, which with five minutes, it's kind of generous and I feel like it's a little too easy. Portal 2 is better, but still falls short. It tests the player on more mechanics, so it tests your familiarity with the basic portal mechanics, as you would expect, and then also the three gels that the game introduces you to about halfway through. You've got the white conversion gel, the orange acceleration gel, and the blue bounce gel, and it uses them to great effect. But Portal 2 has some other great features that just aren't used in the boss fight. You've got the gravity funnels, the hard light surfaces, and the thermal discouragement beam. That does sound dangerous. Why wasn't it used in the boss fight? I think great game design is you not noticing the patterns, just it coming naturally and the game teaching you without you realizing that you're being taught. Uh, but yeah, I'm gonna go play Beat Saber now. Bye. All right, if you watched this far, thank you so much for watching the entire video. I do appreciate it. And if you clicked on it because there was Beat Saber in the thumbnail, well, here's another Beat Saber video that I did a while ago. I don't really stream Beat Saber anymore. Uh, and otherwise, if you like the, the artsy fartsy videos, you might like this video below the Beat Saber one. Ah!